Yomtev, happy holiday to one and all. There is a fascinating uh, issue I want to raise this evening with you. And that is that everybody knows that what is the happiest, or one of the happiest moments in Jewish communities and in Jewish shuls and synagogues throughout the world, it's during the Hakafas. The last days of Sukkot, Shemidi Atzeres, and especially on Simchas Torah, we take out the Torah scrolls from the ark, dance around the bima, around the table where they read the Torah, everyone dances and participates, even the little children with much festivity and dancing and joy and passion and ecstasy, which at first glance, this would seem strange. And let me explain. In Judaism, there are three dimensions. There is what we call biblical mitzvahs, which means mitzvahs that are commanded and instructed in the Torah itself, 613 mitzvahs commanded in the Bible. There are rabbinic commandments, mitzvahs de rabbanon, and these are commandments that were presented to us by the great rabbis and the sages. For example, the holiday of Hanukkah, the holiday of Purim, um, washing our hands before we eat, and so on and so forth. And then there are what we call minhagim, Jewish customs. They're not rabbinic commandments or obligations like Hanukkah, Purim, Halal, washing hands before you eat, lighting Shabbos candles, which are rabbinic obligations or rabbinic prohibitions, but rather Jewish customs. They're called the minhagim. Let's take, for example, the holiday of Sukkot, and let's go through all of the three. There is a biblical commandment, There is a biblical commandment for joy on the holiday of Sukkot. You should be joyous during your festival. This is a mitzvah min hatayra, what's called a mitzvah min a biblical commandment to be happy on Sukkot. Experience happiness. There was something else that used to happen on Sukkot during the temple times, known as Simchas Beis Hashoy Eva. What was this about? Every day in the temple, after the sacrifices, they would also pour wine on the altar, called Nisu Chayayin. Once a year in the holiday of Sukkot, in the morning, after the daily offering of the Tomid lamb, they would pour water. This water was drawn from a well in Jerusalem called the Shiloyach well, and it was accompanied with tremendous festivity. The night before, they would dance all night in the courtyard of the Holy Temple, with torture, torches and flames and juggling and dancing and ecstasy. And in the morning they would go in a procession to the well, draw the water, bring it back to the temple, and then it was poured, as I said, on the altar in the morning after the daily Tamad sacrifice called Nisu Chamayim. This was called Simchas Beis HaShayeva, the joy that's associated with drawing the water, associated or alluded to in the verse in Isaiah, Sha'afta Mayim Besosan Mimaneya Yeshua, you should draw water with joy from the wells of salvation. This mitzvah of Nisu Chamayim is not clearly specified in the Torah. The mitzvah to be happy on Sukkot, that says clearly, the mitzvah to shake a lulav and an esrig and a hadas and a harava, a citron and the, bran- the branch of a palm tree and the myrtle branch and the willow, it's clearly in the Torah. The mitzvah to build a sukkah and sit in the sukkah, the sukkah's teach rushivas yomim, to sit in the sukkah on the sukkah is clearly in the Torah. The mitzvah of pouring the water on the altar every morning after the sacrifice, during the seven days of Sukkot, that's not clearly in the Torah. It's what's known as Allah Lamoshim Sinai. It was a tradition that was transmitted from Moses from Sinai orally from generation to generation to do it. And it was done with great joy. So this was a rabbinic tradition a tradition from Moses, but it was transmitted orally through the rabbis and the sages, not clearly stated in the Torah. It's called halacha l'moyshe misina. 
Then there is Hakafas. Hakafas is not a rabbinic tradition. It's not a biblical commandment. It's not a rabbinic commandment. It's not mentioned in the Talmud. It's a minig. It's not even brought in Shulchan Aruch in the Code of Jewish Law as a law. Rather, Rabbi Moshe Israelish, the great commentator to Shulchan Aruch, the Ramah, writes that it's a minig. It's a Jewish custom that on the last day of Sukkot, Shemini Atzeres, Simchas Torah, especially, depends on the community. Some do it only Simchas Torah, some do it both days. We take out the Torah from the Ark, or the Torahs from the Ark, and we dance with it in honor of the completion of the Torah, because the reading of the Torah is completed on Simchas Torah. In Israel, it's one day, Shemini Atzeres, Simchas Torah are one day. In the diaspora, we have two days. It's a minute, it's a cost. And yet, we see something fascinating. The joy by the hakafas, which means encirclings. Hakafas means encircling, because we encircle the table of the reading with the Torah scrolls. Usually surpasses the joy of the other days of Sukkot. The joy of Sukkot is a biblical commandment. So people are happy. It's a time of festivity. It's a time of joy. We eat meat and we drink wine, and we buy gifts for our children, and according to Allah, before Sukkot, before every of the holidays, Pesach, Shavu, Sukkot, you have to buy new jewelry or a new piece of garment for your wife in order to give her also happiness. And for the children, there's a lot of happiness on Sukkot, beautiful, happy, and joyous holiday. But when is the greatest joy, when is the greatest ecstasy, when is the greatest festivity? When is there the most dancing? Not during Sukkot, on Simchas Torah during Hakafas, which at first glance it seems strange. The joy of Sukkot is a biblical commandment. In other words, it's one of the commandments that God gave to the Jewish people in Torah. Hakafas is a custom. A custom means it's not a commandment, it's not an instruction. It's not God's commandment to the Jewish people. It's a custom, a beautiful custom. And yet, usually, the joy by Hakafas surpasses the joy during the days of Sukkot. And what's fascinating is also the joy of Simchas Beis HaShoeva, when they drew the water and they brought it to the temple to pour on the altar, which doesn't say explicitly in the Torah, transcended the joy which says explicitly in the Torah to be happy on Sukkot. So it's almost, if God says it explicitly, we do it, but we're not so excited. (laughs) If God doesn't say it explicitly, it's a tradition like pouring of the water, there's much more excitement. And then when it comes to Hakafas, which is not even a tradition from Sinai, it's a pure Jewish custom invented by Jews. Here is the greatest joy. How do you explain this? It should have been the other way around. We have our priorities wrong, it seems. I want to share with you an insight about this. Tremendous insight that was once presented by the Lubavitcher Rebbe in the 1940s, yet before he assumed the leadership of Chabad during the lifetime of his father-in-law. The nucleus of the idea is his, but we're going to elaborate it and develop it with a particular metaphor so we should be able to understand it better. Basically, there are three types of relationships. And I'm going to describe each type of the relationship. And if one type describes you, you can raise your hand. Don't worry, nobody else will be able to see. This is true about all forms of relationships. Relationship between spouses, relationship between friends, relationship between parents and children, relationships between a Rebbe and a student, between a master and a student. All forms of relationships can go into these categories. But I'm going to describe it in terms of a marriage since it's the most practical and it's relevant day to day and it affects so many people. And therefore I'm going to use that metaphor. But really the metaphor can be applied whichever stage of life you're in and any type of relationship you're involved in. And everybody's in some type of relationship, hopefully at least with themselves and maybe with a few people. The first level of a relationship is in a marriage. You are the type of husband who fulfills all of the requests of your wife. Your wife says, Yankel, Schmetel, Betel, do me a favor. I need you to do this and this. You say, sure. And you go ahead and you do it. 
You don't procrastinate. You don't delay. You don't find excuses. She asks you to take out the garbage, so a week later the garbage may still be there because you were very busy. No. You go ahead and you do it. She asks you to bring home wine for Shabbos. One thing, you go ahead and you do it. Whatever it may be, she has a request for you from you. She asks you to do something, and you go ahead and you do it. You don't delay, you don't find excuses, you don't procrastinate, you don't throw it back on her, you don't get upset, you don't get frustrated, you don't get angry. Your wife asked you to do something, you do it. In today's world, I would say it's a beautiful relationship. Halavai for every marriage. The wife asks something and the husband goes and does it. The husband asks something, the wife goes ahead and does it. It's a beautiful thing. But there's a much deeper type of relationship. There's a deeper level. What's the second level of a relationship? Your wife doesn't have to ask. Your wife just hints. She gives you a hint that she wants something. And you pick up on the hint, and you go ahead and you do it. This demonstrates a far deeper relationship for two reasons. First of all, it shows that despite the fact that you're a man, you still understand your why you under, you're sensitive to your wife's hints. You understand her intimations. You appreciate her subtleties. So she doesn't have to verbalize her requests with her mouth, but a gaze with the eye, a frown, a gesture with the hand, and so forth. You are sensitive to, you appreciate her subtleties, and you go ahead and you do it. Second of all, it demonstrates that you're not looking for excuses because in this case, when she only hinted what she wanted, you had the greatest excuse in the world. How am I supposed to know this is what you want? Next time, speak clearly. Next time, say it. Don't speak in half sentences. What do you think? I'm your girlfriend. I understand what you mean when you start saying things and you don't finish sentences. You want something, say it. You could have used that excuse very, very well, very efficiently, as many a man does, but you didn't. Why? Because you're connected. Because you're really there for her. Because you're not selfish. Because you're really connected to the person, and therefore she doesn't have to tell it to you. She hints it to you, and it's fine. So you're going by a store, and she points to a piece of jewelry, and she says, Isn't this beautiful? She doesn't have to say more. You go ahead and you buy it. Why? Because the hint suffices. And so on and so forth in many different examples. The second level is a gewaldica relationship. It's an awesome relationship. We can wish it on every marriage. Every marriage should have such a relationship. But then there's a third level. And relative to the third level, the first two are extremely are extremely inferior. Third level is your wife doesn't have to tell you what she wants. She doesn't even have to hint to you what she wants. You on your own anticipate what she would love and you go ahead and you do it. You don't have to be told, not even through hints. You are so deeply connected to the other person. You feel them from within. She doesn't have to communicate it to you, not even subtly. You imagine, you have an intuition what this person would like, and you go ahead and you do it. That demonstrates the deepest relationship. Here there's complete camaraderie. There's true intimacy in the sense of into me see. You gaze into the depth of my soul. I don't even have to hint at you. I don't have to speak everything to you. I don't have to say everything to you. What do they call the, the Germans have a word? Spitzenfingergefühl. You know what Spitzenfingergefühl means? A feeling at the edge of your fingers, the sixth sense, the sense of intuition, intuatia in Yiddish. You sense me, you feel me, I don't have to tell it to you. You know what I need from inside. I don't have to articulate it, I don't have to project it, and you go ahead and you do it because there's a deep oneness. So my dear friends, in our relationship with God, we also have these three dynamics. And that's why Judaism, the body of Yiddishkeit, the body of halacha, the body of Jewish life, is comprised of three categories. There's mitzvahs doiraisa, there's mitzvahs derabonon, and there's minhoge yisrael. There are biblical commandments, there are rabbinic commandments and institutions, and then there are Jewish customs. You know the difference? 
biblical commandments represent that my husband, my wife asks me to do something and I go ahead and do it. God says, listen, my dear Jew, my beloved Jew, I need you to eat kosher. I need you to go to the mikveh. I need you to have a mezuzah on your door. I want you to put on tefillin. I want you to pray. I want you to celebrate Shabbos. I want you to hear the show from Rosh Hashanah to fast on Yom Kippur and to shake a lulav on sukkahs and to sit in a sukkah. This is what I want from you. That's a biblical commandment. God asks and we fulfill, we obey. That's level number one. But that's not all of Judaism. Because in a relationship, although it's great and it's important and it's the foundation of a relationship, but the romance of a relationship, the oomph of a relationship, the drama of a relationship, the mystique of a relationship, the depth of a relationship is not conveyed fully in the clear-cut communication between the husband and the wife. The drama and the mystique of a relationship is conveyed by the husband being sensitive to subtleties, to nuances, to intimations. And this is what the rabbinic tradition is about. Anybody who ever studies the Mishnah or the Talmud knows that all of the rabbinic explanations and institutions and laws are all hinted to in the Torah. What the rabbis did was they were given the text and they were given the formula how to interpret the text. And it was an exact formula. It's not free for all. And then they analyzed and reanalyzed and dissected the text of the Torah based on the formula that was given to them, known as the Yud Gimel Midas, the 13 formulas that were transmitted to them, or different formulas in different places, through which to deduce new laws from the text, through which to be able to understand the proper interpretation, through which to be able to apply it to different circumstances, and to be able to deduce and glean the various ramifications of every single law. The rabbinic literature is basically a study of the hints of the Torah. It's tuning in to the subtleties, to the nuances of the spouse. Understanding that which is not being articulated verbally, but which is being communicated subtly. Let's take the example of pouring of the water. Pouring of the water is a great example. As I said on Sukkot, there is a tradition transmitted that we pour the water on the altar every day. It doesn't say clearly in the Torah. Comes the Talmud, source number one. Tainis dav beizam et beiz, zog de gemar de tanya, Rabbi Yehuda ben Pseiroim. Rabbi Yehuda, the son of Pseiro, says, Nemar b'sheni, about the second day of Sukkot, it says clearly in the Torah, v'nis kehem, and their libations. Usually the offerings have one libation. V'nis wine. V'nis is plural. V'nemar b'shishi unesacheha. On the sixth day also it says, and her libations. Veniska, it should have said, her libation. As I said, with every offering, there was one libation of wine. You poured wine. It says, unusacheha. Venemar bishvi, about the seventh day of Sukkot, it says in the Torah, kemishpatam, as their law. Hare mem yud mem, hare kan mayim. We have an extra mem on day two of Sukkot. And this is the portion of Pinchas. It says, veniskei hem, an extra mem. Day six, unesacheha, an extra yud, which makes it plural, instead of veniska, unesacheha. And on day six, an extra mem, kemishpat tom, instead of kemishpat. Mem yud mem, makes up mayim. Mikan remez lenisach hamayim in atayre. Here the Torah hinted the tradition of pouring water on the days of Sukkot. It's a tradition that was transmitted or- orally from Moses. But there's always a hint in the text What's the hint for the pouring of the water? An extra mem, an extra yud, an extra mem. In the texts of Sukkot, we learn out from here, we have here deduced the pouring of the water. It's hinted to in the Torah. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva has another source. Shenemar b'shishi yunasacheha. On the sixth day it says plurally and her libations. B'shnein nisachin akasav medaba. The Torah clearly believes that on Sukkot there must be two pourings. Echad nisachamayim vechad nisachayayin. One is wine and one is water. There's another fascinating piece in the Talmud, the source number two. Talmud says in Tainus, Yosef Rabbi Yechon of a Kametame, Rabbi Yechon was one sitting and wondering, Amar, he said, Mi'ikemide diksivib iksuvid le'mizi bar'aisa. 
Is there something that is transcribed in the Ksuvim, in the third section of the Pentateuch of the Tanakh? There's Torah, Nevi'im, and Ksuvim that's not written in the Torah itself. Everything must be hinted in the five books of Moses. So rabbinic tradition, Talmudic tradition, is basically a study of God's subtleties, of the nuances of the text, delving into the nuance, the subtleties, and finding the hints, understanding not just what my spouse says, also what my spouse means, understanding her intimations, her nuance, her subtlety. That's the concept of rabbinic obligations, rabbinic commandments, rabbinic traditions. All the laws of the rabbis are hinted to in the Torah. Then we have the third category of Judaism, and that's a minig, a Jewish custom. What's a Jewish custom? The Jew imagines what God would love, and he or she goes ahead and does it. Rabbinic and biblical mitzvahs. Biblical mitzvahs, God says, I do. Rabbinic mitzvahs or laws, God hints, I do. A minig, a custom, doesn't say, doesn't end. The Jewish people, the Jewish consciousness, the collective consciousness of Knesset Yisrael of the Jewish people are one with the divine. They're mamash one. They sense what God would love. They anticipate it. They have intuition. And they go ahead and institute a custom. A minic. This will explain something very interesting. Back to Relationships in the three levels of the relationship. Where are the consequences of disengagement most severe? If I fail to do something my wife really asks me to do, if I fail to do something that she hints for me to do, or if I fail to do something that I know she would have liked. Obviously, in the latter two, the consequences cannot be negative. If I fail to do something I know my wife would have liked, there's no consequences. Even if I fail to do something she hints for me to do, there's not severe consequences, not such severe consequences. But if she asks me to do something and I don't do it, she'll naturally be upset. So when it comes to not doing it, the consequences are more dire in category number one. But let me ask you, where is the greatest celebration? Where is the greatest joy where is the greatest demonstration of intimacy in the first or the second or the third? Obviously in the third. The first one means we're in a good, civil, respectful relationship. The second means, the second category, we have a deep relationship. The third category means we're one. Same is true between God and the Jewish people. When I fail to do a biblical commandment, the consequences are more serious because we're in a relationship. We're interconnected. We're deeply interwoven. Our lives are not alone. What we do and we don't do matters. And when God asks me to do something and I don't do it, it has very deep significance. There are very deep consequences to me, my soul, and the world, and all of history because of the greatness of a person. When I fail to do a rabbinic commandment, the consequences are less. When I fail to do a custom, not many consequences. But where is the joy? The joy is by a custom. More than a rabbinic commandment. More than a biblical commandment. In fact, the joy accelerates. A biblical commandment, a lot of joy. A rabbinic commandment, even more joy because it represents a deeper intimacy. A custom, the greatest joy. Hence, we understand the structure of Sukkot. The joy to be happy on Sukkot is a biblical commandment. God says, I want you happy. So we're happy. We're very happy. And we do whatever we have to do to be happy. Pouring the water is a commandment of God hinted to in the Torah. We catch the subtlety. We catch the nuance. Here the joy is even greater. Here the relationship that's celebrated is more profound. There's much more dancing and much more joy. Simchas beis ha But hakafis, we take the Torah and we dance on Shmini Atzeret and Simchas Torah. Here we're fulfilling a custom aminik. Here we're celebrating the deep oneness between God and His people. 
complete camaraderie, complete unity, complete fusion. And this brings forth the deepest joy. I'll tell you a story about the Baal Shem Tov. One of the students of the Baal Shem Tov asked his master, he said, Rebbe, tell me, how do I learn about Ahava Sisral? How do I learn about loving another Jew? What does it mean to love another Jew? The Baal Shem Tov said, I want you to travel to this particular inn, this particular Kretschme in Yiddish. He travels to this inn. These inns, they would have bars where they would serve drinks to peasants who would come drink, warm their bones on a cold Russian or Polish winter night and sleep over or leave. And the Chassid sits down in the bar. He really did not have much to do in that particular inn or bar. He was not a drinker. He was not an alcoholic. He was not to have drinks as part of the routine of his life. But he sat. The Baal Shem Tov told him to go. He went. There are two peasants sitting and drinking and are becoming quite inebriated and intoxicated. And finally, when they're both very, very tipsy, one peasant turns to the other peasant and says, tell me, What's bothering me? He says, how should I know what's bothering you? You didn't tell me what's bothering you. He says, tell me, you consider yourself my friend? So of course I consider myself your friend. We're great friends. We're great buddies. We're great pals. We're close friends. So he says, that's not true. You're not my friend. And he's drunk, so he's saying it with a lot of passion. He says, why do you say that? And he says, because if you would be my friend, you would know what's bothering me. The Chassid understood that he just learned what it means to be a friend to somebody else. Have a good Yom Tov.